Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. This is the first Sunday after Pentecost, which we know as Trinity Sunday, the day when we celebrate the doctrine of the three persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we haven't met yet, my name is Margaret Priest, and I am a Methodist local preacher on the Driffield Hornsey circuit. Now, as you can see, I am standing in your pulpit today in Hornsey United Reformed Church. And I have to say, when I came in, it's the first time I've been in a church building for 14 months. And I walked in your church and I felt quite overwhelmed and quite touched. And I hope that you experience that same feeling next Sunday if you can. Now, in the church, as Steve has already said, we've got Steve and Mike and Carol doing all the technical stuff, and we're very grateful for those people doing that. But I actually feel a bit lonely. I'm here and in this pulpit, and I feel all alone, and I'm looking at empty pulpits, empty seats, empty pews. So do me a favor, everybody. Give me a wave. Come on, everybody. Give me a wave. I know you sat at home in your onesies and your pyjamas, so come on, give me a wave. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. I feel much better now. Thank you. And so today, on this Trinity Sunday, our call to worship is this. Holy, holy, holy is our wonderful God, creator, saviour, sustainer. Let us worship our God of infinite mystery, who is closer to us than our own breath. Let us pray. Wonderful God, as we gaze at the miracle of your world, intricate and interconnected, huge in scope, microscopic in detail, we are amazed. We wonder that you love each one of us, seeing us, knowing us, and filling us with the breath of life. Help us to worship you as mystery, to hug you as a friend, and with you to care for the whole of creation. Amen. Our first hymn today, with thanks to the National Methodist Virtual Choir and others, we're going to sing together 10,000 Reasons.
Wow, doesn't it get you right there? And I hope that you were singing so loudly that all your neighbours heard you and joined in. We come to our Lord in prayer now. First of all, a prayer of approach, which is based on Psalm 29. Let us pray. We gather in your name, O Lord, for you are the Lord who gives strength to your people and who blesses them with grace. You are the Lord who comes close to your people and draws them into your heart. You are the Lord who equips your people and calls them to serve you in the world. You are the Lord who loves your people and invites them into the fellowship of the Holy Trinity. You are the Lord and we worship you. Amen. God of truth, we bring to you our sorrow for our sins, for seeking earthly absolutes and not eternal mysteries. We are truly sorry for rooting ourselves in the finite and not nurturing the infinite within. We are truly sorry for saying I much more than we, and for damaging relationships. We are truly sorry. Forgive us and strengthen us, we pray, for we are truly sorry. Amen. Dear friends, it is because God loves us that we are forgiven. It is because Jesus died for us that we are redeemed. And it is because we are born anew in the spirit that we are saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, we know that we cannot give our gifts of money in the normal way at the moment, but we found other methods of giving and we haven't been deterred because we know how important our gifts are. And so we ask your blessing on our gifts of money and ask you to help us to use them wisely in your work, vision, and kingdom here on earth. This we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we say the traditional version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now Jackie Bradley is going to bring our Old Testament reading to us. The reading is from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on his throne, high and exalted, and his robe filled the whole temple. Around him, flaming creatures were standing, each of which had six wings. Each creature covered its face with two wings and its body with two and used the other two for flying. They were calling out to each other, holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. His glory fills the world. 
The sound of their voices made the foundation of the temple shake and the temple itself became filled with smoke. I said, there is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful. And I live among a people whose every word is sinful. And yet with my own eyes, I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, this has touched your lips and now your guilt is gone and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord say, whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? I answered, I will go, send me. And now we're going to sing a hymn called, Have You Heard God's Voice? Have you heard God's voice? Has your heart been still? Are you still prepared to follow? Have you made a choice to remain and serve? Though the way be rough and narrow, will you walk the path that will cost you much and embrace the pain and sorrow? Will you trust in one who entrusts to you the disciples of tomorrow? Will you use your voice? Will you not sit down when the multitudes are silent? Will you to stand your ground when the crowds are turning violent will you walk the path that will cost you much and embrace the pain and sorrow will you trust in one who entrusts to you the disciples of tomorrow city streets will you be God's heart will you listen to the voiceless will you stop and eat and when friendships start will you share your faith with the faithless will you Will you watch the news with the 
That song uh, was performed by Matt Beckingham, and Matt Beckingham has been helping the Methodist Church produce online worship, and so he's got a, a library of hymns from the Methodist hymn book, Singing the Faith. Now, I must tell you that I am a simple lass, and so I'm not going to go into deep theological expositions about the Trinity. Now, did I hear everybody going, oh, thank goodness for that? No, I much prefer to be a bit more practical in my preaching, and hopefully we can open up some pathways for us to explore together. So to start with, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you ready for this? How do you describe the Trinity? What words or phrases do you use to describe the Trinity? Yes, I can hear you, actually. I can hear you. You're saying things like three and one or three in one, which actually sounds more like a tin of oil, but other brands are available. But then, of course, we, we run out of words. Our vocabulary isn't good enough. It's too limited to describe the Trinity in words. So let me ask you another question. What images do you use when you think about the Trinity? Now, on the screen now, you can see a rather beautiful stained glass window of the Trinity. I like this. It shows the three entities all within one image. Or perhaps you might like to prefer to think about a more classical diagram like this trinity knot, also known as a Celtic love knot or a trefoil knot. This iconic symbol, if you follow the line round the three leaves, it makes an eternal form which cannot be untied and then there's a slightly more complex version of the Celtic trefoil with a circle intertwining the leaves. And that adds another dimension of this unbroken continuum. Now, you might like to think about the Trinity as being something more like a shamrock, three leaves on one stalk. A pal once told me that he thinks about the Trinity like a candle. And he says there's a wick, which is basically just a piece of string, which is surrounded by wax, which symbolizes God the sustainer. But then the, the real magic comes when you set light to the wick. And the flame is the Holy Spirit, which becomes a light to our darkened world. And I quite like that analogy of a, a Trinity candle, but not as much as I like this one. Now, these are two of my three sisters. Dot is, uh, Jean is wearing a red jumper and Dot's wearing a blue one. And whatever you do, please don't tell my sisters that they are up on this screen today. They'll have a dicky fit but I'm using them for this illustration. Now, Dot, the one in blue, to some people, Dot is a businesswoman because she is a director of a wool company. She's also a member of the Inner Wheel, which is um, associated with the Rotary Club. And so people there see Dot as a, a businesswoman who does charitable acts. Her son, James, to her son, James, Dot is a mother. To James's wife, Emma, Dot is the dreaded mother-in-law. To her two granddaughters, she's a lovely grandma. And she is also a wife and companion to her husband, David. To her choir at church, Dot is very much a valued contralto. And at church, she's a good attender, and she holds many roles there. To network, which is uh, the Methodist version of women's work, she's a valued member and leader. 
She also runs a memory cafe in the town where she lives. She is um, part of the cricket fraternity and she's a devoted supporter. She is a sister-in-law, an auntie, a niece, a cousin. To me, she is a sister and a friend and a confidant. Now, do you see where I'm going with this? For each role that Dot plays, she uses different characteristics to fill that identity. You might say she wears different hats. She will talk and act differently to a colleague or a business associate than she does to me. She will talk differently and act differently to her grandchildren than when she's meeting with members of the choir. But she's still Dot. She's just one person. So then with that in mind, and this is purely my own opinion, think of each of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Is that so much different from one being with different characteristics? Of course, this is, I mean, this is just my way of wrestling with the mystery of the Trinity. And I'm not asking anyone to adopt my way of thinking. And I, and I really do wish now at this point that you were actually here with me because I would love to be able to talk to you and ask you what, how you describe or think of the Trinity. But for now, let's hear how Jesus introduces the Trinity to humankind. And Amber Louise is going to bring our New Testament reading. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the spirit who reveals the truth about God. The world cannot receive him because it cannot see him or know him, but you know because he remains with you and is in you. When I go, you will be le not left all alone. I will come back with to you. In a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me, and because I live, you also will live. When the day comes, you will know I am in my Father, and that you are in me, just as I am in you. Right, everybody, it's time to get those singing voices going again, because we're going to be going to sing, there's a spirit in the air.
And that hymn was brought to us by the North Ollerton Methodist Church Choir. So where did the doctrine of the Trinity come from? Don't all answer at once. You see, there's no clear mention of the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible. The early Christians, they knew about the one almighty God, and they had their own experience of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They met God in Jesus, and they met God in the Spirit. We know that they were starting to think about it. They even use the three in the same sentence, but there's no mention of the word Trinity. And many passages, especially in John's gospel, as we heard this morning, explore the relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit in a way that would become the basis for the doctrine of the Trinity. And this was based on the people's experience of living and working with Jesus before and after the resurrection and in the life and prayer of the early church. But even before that, right back at the start of time, the beginning of creation, in the, in the Bible, we read that in the beginning, God created, God created the creator. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And here's something else for you to consider. In the Bible, there are hints of three beings scattered throughout the Bible. For example, remember the three visitors of Abraham. Now, this is from Genesis 18, verses 1 to 3. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre whilst he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. So the Lord appeared to Abraham, and there were three men. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. You see, he knew who he was meeting that day. And knowing what we believe we know today, you really have to wonder, don't you? But the actual doctrine of the Trinity took years to formulate. And you know, even then, they got it wrong. At the first council of Nicaea in the year 325, which I know some of you remember very well, learned scholars and theologians got their heads together and they came up with the first version of the Nicene Creed. You know the one, I believe, in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life. But they made a dreadful mistake because in that first version of the Nicene Creed, they never mentioned the Holy Spirit. 56 years later, in the year 831, in Constantinople, which it's not Constantinople, it's Istanbul now, they amended the Nicene Creed, stating that the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped and glorified with the Father and the Son. But we won't be too hard on those ancient theologians and scholars because they only had the same data and information that we have today. And could we do any better at solving an unsolvable mystery? Because that's what the Trinity is. It's a mystery. Gregory was a fourth century archbishop of Constantinople and theologian. 
And Gregory would say of the Trinity, I, I love this chap, Gregory. He says, no sooner do I conceive of the one than I am illuminated by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish three than I'm carried back into one. When I think of any of the three, I think of him as the whole and my eyes are filled and the greater part of what I'm thinking escapes me. I cannot grasp the greatness of that one so as to attribute a greater greatness to the rest. When I contemplate the three together, I see but one torch and I cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. And I love that because, you know, this is what we do. You, for a moment, you can just, you think, I've got it. I've grasped it. The Trinity, I can see it. And then poof, it's gone. Just like Gregory says, the greater part of what I'm thinking escapes me. The Trinity is a mystery. And I don't think that it's something that you can simplify and try to explain. It's more worthy than that. And here's a thought that natters me to death at times. It really does. We can barely comprehend the thought of a triune God. And yet, in my heart of hearts, I still think we try to make our God too small. Hmm? I'm convinced that there is much, much more to our God, and perhaps even more than the, the three in one that we try to encapsulate. For example, the Bible speaks of God's wisdom, but that wisdom is personified. Actually, it's a female. And then we talk about the second coming and we understand the second coming. There will be a second coming. And we believe that this is a part of, of God which we've never seen before. So I would urge you, not to shy away from wrestling with the doctrine of the Trinity or even more than the Trinity because our God is big. It isn't easy. But if it were, then there wouldn't be a mystery. And our God is both mysterious and awe-inspiring and yet is intimate and incarnate. The doctrine of the Trinity can absorb you. You know, I've been preaching now for over 30 years, and I don't think I'm any closer or clearer now about the Trinity than I was 30 years ago. And you know what? I'm glad about that. I'm glad, and I thank God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit for the mysterious Trinity. Amen. Now, Jill Fletcher will lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. You are the light that the darkness can never conquer. Pour your light into the darkness of this world. Pour your light into the confusion of our new way of being so that people can see new strategies and possibilities. Pour your light into us so we can see a way forward. Pour your love into the hearts of all who have been abandoned or let down, worry to love again. Pour your love into the troubled minds of those suffering mental distress, looking for peace. Please guide them in their way forward. Pour your peace into the many conflicts happening around the world. 
guide them to come to some level of understanding. Pour your peace into the hearts of those seeking to bring an end to aggression and harm to the oppressed. Pour your peace into our own hearts as we manoeuvre the complexities of our own community. Lord, pour your love into our hearts as we place before you the names of those in our own church family. On this day, we think about Mark and Kate. We pray for Dawn and her recovery. We remember Brenda and her struggle ahead. We think of Ken at this hard time. And we, in a happier, to happier frame of, of mind, we think about all those enjoying half term, that's the teachers and the children. <coughs> and we think of Marie and Chris getting married. Those who are having a difficult time coming to terms with their challenges or accepting their situation. Pour your love to these people on all those within our church as we gather together today. We receive your love and use it to spread the glory and comfort of your word. We say and offer these prayers to you. Amen. Our closing hymn, with thanks to emu music, all people that on earth do dwell. Come now be 
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Wonderful God, help us to keep adventuring with you. May we allow ourselves to be filled with visions of your awesomeness. And may we know your presence closer to us than our own breathing. Thank you for creating us, for being visible to us in Jesus and for inspiring and empowering us with your interweaving spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.